It's wonderful to be here. This uh, topic is, uh, just as a topic, it's bewildering. I remember one day I uh, spent three hours talking with James Lindsay in Vocal Distance um, in a conversation about the theoretical level, the critical theory and, and the dialectic level. And then I had a five minute break to go urinate and I came back on and I had a two hour conversation with Sasha and two moms and Lisa here and we went from this high level theoretical conversation to this very, very personal, very direct, like the, 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 the bond between mothers and children is just the opposite of this critical theory stuff. And you can see that already today, we have these, we're, we're laying out this really, these different tiers of narrative on, on what we're talking about and what we're up against, if that's how we want to adopt it. And one of the key aspects of that is narrative. How do we talk about this? How do we frame this conversation? And that's where the media comes in. That's where journalism comes in. So this conversation, we're going to speak with these panelists about how they got into gender and how they see the narrative unfolding on the mainstream and then on this uh, kind of more independent or fringe media um, landscape. And as we describe that, we can, we can talk about this love affair with this aspect of gender and why, it, why it's such a, a magical concept that just captures our imagination. So if you would like to introduce yourselves and then tell us how you got into this topic. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Pamela Pereski. First of all, Stella and everybody at GenSpec, thank you. This is an incredible group of people who are uh, convened here, and it's great to be able to speak to, um, as Michael Schellenberger said, potential friends. Um, uh, I got into this um, area of inquiry because I was looking at illiberalism. Um, when I was working on the coddling of the American mind with Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, um, I had to become their subject matter expert on a number of things, including critical theory. And um, I've been concerned about illiberalism for quite a while. And I started to see that there were two completely different moral paradigms that were being um, uh, sort of embodied. Um, and, the, and, and the gender issue is an embodiment, a literal embodiment of illiberalism. Um, the, a liberal moral paradigm really um, depends on um, uh, uh, the locus of moral agency being the individual, um, the morality or, or immorality of an action being inherent in the action, and that intention is part of the impact. Um, that truth exists, and that words convey information and help us think about reality. Um, and the, the illiberal moral paradigm is the inversion of all of those things. Uh, the locus of moral agency is power. Um, the, the disempowered are morally good and the empowered are morally bad. The morality or immorality of an action depends on the identities of the actor and the target and the relative power imbalance. Um, intention has nothing to do with impact. Um, truth and objectivity are white supremacist concepts. Uh, and words are not the things that we use to convey information about the world and uh, help us think about reality. Um, they are the material that creates reality. So that's how I got into this. And of course, we can talk more about what those things mean. Great. My name is Ben Appel. Um, I am, like Pamela, just so grateful to be here. I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by the company that I find here. I'm just excited to meet so many people I've admired from afar for a really long time. So um, I got into this probably, I, I think around 2017, I had uh, returned to school. I was a Columbia student um, in my 30s. I, I, they have a program there for non-traditional students, people who had left college years ago and, and, and then went back to school. So I got my undergraduate degree from Columbia between 2017 and 2020. Um, which was a really you know crazy time to be there. You know, my first week Trump was inaugurated, so it was a really tense time on campus. And I kind of entered the space as this so-called progressive radical. Um, I was intent on being you know an LGBTQ journalist and and writer. I was studying writing there, 
I interned for GLAAD my first summer, and it was there that I really kind of saw the inner workings of this organization and kind of, and what and the dogma that was that was fueling their advocacy. And I had these internal questions that were heretical, and I didn't you know want to say them out loud, even let myself really think them. I was really uh, suppressing my speech, but also even my own thoughts. Um, and I started to, when there was a lot of talk about the trans kid and the trans girl, I started to look back on my own history and kind of start to interrogate what's the difference between a trans girl and the boy that I was as a kid who loved My Little Ponies and wearing skirts and playing with girls and doing all kinds of girl things and was called a girl and was made fun of in middle school and had his sex questioned and interrogated all the time. Um, are you a boy or a girl, et cetera, um, and who grew up to be gay? Um, and, and, and you know what was the, the, the overlap there? And so I started to become concerned about that. And then meanwhile, at Columbia, I was um, studying a lot of human rights issues, but also a lot of gender and sexuality, and in fact, in the Middle East, in, um, in the Ottoman world, and also modern Muslim world. And I started to learn about what was going on, especially in Iran, with, with transitioning homosexuals, uh, because homosexuality is illegal in Iran and a lot of is, uh, countries under Islamic law. And I started to notice a certain parallel between practices that were occurring here and there. And I start, and I at first kind of, again, just kept these thoughts to myself. And I thought, that, you know, that's just a weird conspiracy and level of paranoid thinking that, you know, they're certainly not... Um, we're in a liberal, you know, country. This, this, you know, democracy that we live in, America, is not practicing the same kind of medicine that that the Islamic regime is in Iran. But then, when I started to educate myself more about these issues and read the works of scholars who were almost writing about their practices and in, in, through a sympathetic lens, I realized that there was quite a bit of. Um, commonality between what was occurring here and what was occurring there. And that really concerned me. So I just kind of started to become a little bit more vocal and a little bit more um, really intent on researching and getting deeper into it. And then I published a couple pieces in that, you know, once you're in it, um, you are, <laughs> you're branded and that's it. And so I, there's really no turning back, but I'm glad because I, I don't intend to. Hi, I'm Christina Buttons, and I became a journalist um, that almost exclusively covers this issue because of the way that mainstream media outlets have failed to objectively report on it. Um, I was always a, a good Democrat because I voted accordingly and I didn't ask questions. Um, when, I, when I started digging into this issue further and looking beyond the headlines, it threw my world upside down. It was a very disorienting experience because I trusted the mainstream media. I thought that they were always going to provide balanced, fair reporting. Um, and now I feel like I've had to reevaluate everything I've ever learned through mainstream media. What else have they been misinforming me about? Um, and it makes you feel like a conspiracy theorist because you know the mainstream media, the Biden administration, academia, medical institutions, and civil rights orgs are all wrong about this issue. And uh, it's a challenge to convince other people who haven't had this kind of like red pill moment that all of those institutions are wrong and you are right. But I became obsessed in my way that I do. And um, I've found that there is no good evidence to support the affirmative model in its pseudoscience. And people need to know the truth. And that's why I became a journalist. Ditto, almost. <laughs> I was already a journalist. I'm Lisa Sullen Davis. I've been a freelance journalist for 20 years. I've written for most major um, media outlets. And I also had a good friend who wrote a book about trans teens in 2012, and she had a trans foster daughter. So I was very accepting of the premise that there was a thing called a trans kid. Um, 
then I had a kid. I, some of you know the story, but anyway, she was very masculine, and there seemed to be um, no understanding of her. And we experienced a lot of pressure to socially transition her um, out of the kindness of the hearts of the, of the medical community and the school community. And um, she eventually found the word tomboy to describe herself, and I thought, oh yeah, that was my entire childhood. Even I looked like a tomboy, despite uh, having no sports ability whatsoever. <laughs> so that started my digging. And, and I had been, I started from the ground up. I had no training. You can look up one of my first articles about concrete slab foundations. I would just write about anything to learn how to do it. Um, but I wrote an op-ed in 2017, um, again, accepting the premise of a trans child and saying, why is, there, why is there no room for this kind of tomboyish girl? And um, that was in the New York Times. And that's when I realized I had, I had stepped in a decades old culture war between feminists and, and trans ideologists. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that, but I, I think what happened to me in those intervening years is also what happened to the media. So um, I will say that, as a lot of you know, I ended up feeling complicit in the way I was writing about things, and I, and I did spend many years trying to get your stories into the mainstream media. I, I um, never, ever imagined that it would be this hard or that once I became willing to do it, talking to my husband and what would happen to our family, um, what would happen to my child if I told the truth, <clears throat> if we decided it had to be done, I never imagined that years later I still would not have succeeded. But things are, things are, they have to change now and they are changing. But I'm, I'm sorry for those of you I failed and um, I will get your stories out there eventually. <laughs> So, Lisa, could you open up the, could you kind of tell us a little bit, being on the inside of, of media, like why, why gender, and why did it kind of coalesce in the direction that it has? Yeah, I, I, there's always been, you know, a fascination with gender, and there's a, fa I think it was Stephen Levine who said that there was, at the Segum conference, that, you know, clinicians were fascinated with the idea that people could change sex. And, the, and when Christine Jorgensen, you know, landed from Den, Denmark, is that where she went? Anyway, or he, um, you know, there was a huge media blitz. So there's a fascination with this subject on, in all media, not just the left media. But the left media or the liberal media or mainstream media or legacy media is, is unable to report honestly about it. And so the question is why? And the, the answer could take all day, but I recommend reading Batia Unger Sarsen's book, Bad News. Um, it's about race, but you could just put gender in there and it would be the same thing. So there's been a demographic shift in who journalists are. You know, that used to be a working class profession. It's, a, it's an upper class profession. It pays very badly. Uh, so you have to either have family money or rent stabilized real estate. Um, and there's, so there's less concern with class issues and, there, and this, this issue has occurred more among you know, the upper classes. Um, there's also, in addition to that demographic shift, Trump derangement syndrome is real. So in 2016, you know, as the, the class of people uh, participating in journalism were more and more liberal, more and more upper class, more and more in a bubble of their own, Trump was elected and there were, um, for instance, at um, a certain, okay, I won't say what it was, but, a, but um, an important um, liberal media outlet, there were journalists who came in and said, we have to have an emergency meeting, we cannot do 
we cannot cover both sides like this anymore. The other side are bad actors. You know, Trump behaved in ways that violated certain norms. No one knew how to compare that to the way other people were acting. So I know there are probably people who love Trump in here, um, but that is part of what happened. And then, and then George Floyd sort of sealed the deal on that of, it is no longer our duty to tell the truth, it is our duty to fix these societal wrongs. But all of that blinded people to um, being able to be nuanced or complex or see things from multiple sides and everything that Pamela explained happened. And I will say, um, it got institutionalized right down to the style guides, because I had this problem, right? We have to write, if you're writing for a mainstream media outlet, you have to write sex assigned at birth. I tried to get the word detransitioner in a CNN article, and it, it was very difficult, and in the end, I, I allowed myself to be pressured to take it out. And um, so it's almost like, they're almost like blasphemy laws, and they are encoded in, in the style guides of media companies. Um, there was also a study a couple of years ago that said when the media reports adverse effects related to gender affirming care, I feel like this was an Australian study, that demand goes down. So rather than be interested in that and talk about that, what, what is our ethical duty then as journalists? That was really interpreted as we shouldn't report about things going wrong because then fewer people will be seeking this care. So every, everything got um, funneled through the black and white thinking. And, and I'll just say my, my final thought about it, as I've done a lot of research recently around the concept of gender identity and talking to Alex Byrne, who's here, who's going to speak today or tomorrow, um, and really thinking about gender identity as this cognitive phase for toddlers to preschoolers and um, the way it's been interpreted and accepted by all of these institutions. And although I believe that objectivity is an important goal for journalists, and I will always admit my biases when I'm reporting, but I will talk to anybody, I will listen to anybody but um, I will filter it through my own acceptance of gender nonconformity as normal, as a normal variation. But I think our biggest problem right now is that if you accept the idea of gender identity, if you're a journalist and you accept that idea of a gendered soul, it's very hard to, to report this issue and it, what it does, what's happened in the last 10 years is we've uh, moved the burden of proof. So if you look at New York Times articles from 2013 about Coy Mathis, a, a first grader suing the Denver School District to use the girls' bathroom, it'll say a boy, a little boy who identifies as a girl. Right? So the, the burden of proof was on the family to prove that this was real. And then, you know, 10 years later, the burden of proof is on anyone who objects, but anyone objects is a, is a bigot or, or right wing, and those are conflated. That's what happened. In, <laughs> in a, that'll be a long chapter, but that's in my book, but that's a synopsis. If I can follow up on that, you know, what I was saying about the different ways that a, a liberal moral paradigm and an illiberal moral paradigm thinks about words and what words do. Um, how that happened, and especially with the help of the media, was how the media chose to use words. And when you were talking about the, the style guide, um, it, it, there's um, a shift from journalism as independent, as truth-seeking, um, as having standards of accuracy and objectivity and transparency and contextualization. And all of those things have gone away in order to, in some people's minds, present the truth, meaning the moral truth. Instead of looking for accuracy, seeking truth, and trying to present facts so that people can make up their own minds, we're now seeing media present moral truths as if they are a replacement for facts. And that's, and with these words, you know, um, the APA style guide says, um, not all people fall under one of two categories for sex or gender. And says, gender is not synonymous with sex. So they're saying, there's more than two sexes. 
is what the style guide is saying. So they're asserting something as if it's true in the use of their language. Um, and I, I want to actually point out that gender, the reason I got into gender, as I said before, is because I was looking at illiberalism in general, and it shows up in all kinds of ways. One way that we're seeing it powerfully show up right now is with respect to Israel. If you can have students at the most elite, uh, selective universities literally, genuinely defending the rape of children and the slaughter of families in their beds. And I mean, the same people who were crying about microaggressions are defending this. You can see the complete moral inversion. And that also happened with words because these are not terrorists, they're resistance, freedom fighters, et cetera. And the AP style guide for them says to avoid referring to Hamas as a terrorist organization, even though it is an internationally designated terror organization. Uh, it says only use those terms when quoting people. <laughs> I will yield. <laughs> ben and Christina, do you uh, have any riffs on this? Uh, they're just people aren't acting as journalists anymore, they're just acting as activists. And um, if they had, they have a prescribed narrative, we all know what it is, you know. The rise in trans identification is due to societal acceptance, gender affirming care is evidence-based and life-saving, and if detransition is rare, minors aren't getting surgeries, you know, they'll kill themselves if they don't get it, we all know all of these prescribed narratives and you know anybody who deviates from them gets labeled a bigot. Um, but they're, they're doing a real disservice to people because they're not digging into this issue further. They're not doing their jobs. Yeah, and I, and I, I exactly. exactly, and I, I do wanna say too that like I, for me personally, it's really difficult to write about this and report on it, and I know that a lot of people have difficulty as well because we're dealing with like an incoherent ideology. You know, people talk, mention a lot. You know, the in incoherency or the the confusion is is a, a feature, not a bug, and that's that is the reality of the the situation. So when you're writing about these things and covering this topic, the rules are always changing, and they can change. You know, if if you challenge something that someone said verbatim, um, you know, another f folks over in this corner will say, oh, they, they didn't say that, or that's not what we actually think, and that's not what the, the majority thinks. It's always changing. There's really no uh, agreement, even in the trans radical activist community, if you want to call it that, about what transgenderism is, about what 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 comprises transgenderism? There's there's so much disagreement, and 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 folks who are the most influential in that movement will admit that willingly and openly, and that it's almost kind of seen as this um, a, a positive uh, that that there's it's all about breaking down boundaries and 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 blurring um, boundaries and queering queering reality, and so it is really tricky to write about and cover, and so it's frustrating, and so I think that it's really important maybe to really tease that apart in coverage of this issue, like when you bring in thoughts like critical theory or queer theory or CRT, those words are so triggering for like a lot of leftists and liberals because they've been so politicized. But the reality is, is that you have to be able to talk about these things in and understand them and, and, and see how they've invaded the conversation and how they really dictate about like how people are covering this issue. It's nonsensical and there's not a uh, uh, coherence to it. So you're dealing with um, with people that are just denying material reality or, or saying that it's an inconvenient um, or just refusing to deal with it. And so, and one last thing I'll say too is that, you know, when we talk about trans, we talk, like Lisa was saying, you could read Baia's book and you could just substitute gender for race. There is a really conscious effort to 
marry all of these issues together. You, you can't, if you are opposed, if you are opposed at all to, let's say, the transition of, of minors, then you are also have racist inclinations. You also are classist. You're also not properly anti-capitalist. You're not properly, it really does all work that tightly together. So to actually tease these things apart um, and really get into the annoying minutia of it, but that in a way that people understand, I think is, um, is a challenge for me and that's what I try, am trying to do. If I can follow up on that, you know, you're making me think about how the media uh, sort of um, uh, helps people avoid accountability for what they say by, um, by the, what I'm thinking about is, for example, defund the police. And the media reports it as if it's a metaphor, right? Um, and then things happen and police departments get defunded and people go, wait, what happened, you know? Um, or um, in, in the realm of, uh, of the Israel um, issue, when, you, when the media would interview people in Arabic, they would say, we want to kill Jews. And they would translate it as, we want to kill Zionists. And you know, this is reported, I mean, you can read Mati uh, Friedman has written about this, and I've seen it in videos myself where you can hear them saying Yahud. And they, in the, uh, in the translation, it says, Zionists. Um, and then with this, you know, the, the slide that um, was shown before where the pronouns are, you know, respect pronouns or your or respect trans people or your pronouns will be was, were, you know, that threatening language. And then nobody's held accountable for that language. It's like, oh, it's just hyperbole. They don't really mean it. Uh, that's the sort of thing where the media gets involved in, um, in making things less clear instead of more clear. Can I just say one thing really quickly, too, before anybody else has something to say? I also really want to stress that so many times when I see reporting now, I just think to myself, and this has occurred to me so many times over the past number of months, if only people would talk about the typology of transgenderism, if only people would talk about homosexual transgenders, transgender people and autogynophilia, if only that would, if more people were aware and we were actually able to talk about these issues because that is the main, to me, the main roadblock because otherwise when you come and you say, I don't, I'm not really, I have concerns about this, it's like, oh, you don't support trans people. And it's like, well, you know, what is a trans person? And when it becomes this about the spirit and the gendered soul and, and, and these things that, this amorphous idea about people being born this way and it's, you know, unearthing the, the true authentic self, in reality it's like there's something called gender dysphoria and, and some people experience it and some people grow up to find that they can benefit from medical transition or not, et cetera. But it's, it's so much more complicated. Actually, it's not really complicated. It's actually really straightforward. And there is a lot of research and knowledge. There's a big knowledge base about this that's obviously been suppressed. And these people have been demonized for doing this work. But I feel like for me, that's such a huge roadblock is if only people at the times where anybody just started introducing these concepts about like, hey, this is this is the motivation for for people transitioning. You know, there's a lot of gay folks that I mean to listen to the stories of people who I've interviewed here of gay people who have detransitioned de who said that it was about homophobia. Like Shapes says, who, who I love says, you know, it's not gender dysphoria; it's social dysphoria. It is society not making room for people to be gender nonconforming and to expect them to change their bodies and change who they are to fit into, into society. And so it, it, that's, a, that's a liberal issue. Um, and that's something that the leftist media, by ignoring that, those stories, everybody's stories, those stories for me, from a personal perspective, is egregious that, that, that that's not uh, discussed or talked about. And from a psychological perspective, I'm also a psychologist, which I didn't, I didn't mention before, but from a psychological perspective, one of the inversions that we see is the replacement of reality and metaphor, and metaphor with reality. So we used to know that when somebody said, I'm, I'm born in the wrong body, it was a metaphor. And it was, it was a description of how they felt. 
And we've made that into, somehow as a society, we've made that into a reality. And all those things that I was talking about before were people things they, they were really saying, and, and the, the media's uh, description of it is just a metaphor. To, the, to that end, I think having a, a generation that believes language is violence is, is hugely problematic. And also the way that legacy media frames this issue. So again, so that your belief system is encoded in how you write about it. And one of the biggest problems is when the media writes healthcare for transgender children, right? It's the healthcare that makes that help someone transition and become trans, transgender, you know, as a, I think as Lisa Marciano says, as a coping strategy. And they're not born transgender, trans, transgender. This isn't the health care they need. This is the health care they seek to cope for whatever reason. And that also has to do with the, uh, the aggregating, the, the, you know, not just LGBTQIA 2S, uh, plus, plus, but um, but conflating all of these different issues as if they're one thing. And I've been forcing myself um, to watch all of I Am Jazz. And if anyone else does that, I would like uh, you to come uh, form a support group with me. Um, <laughs> But you can see, you can see in the, by, by, you know, by the second season that, to Ben's point, there are a lot of different kinds of trans people, trans children, all being cast as the same thing. And Jazz's etiology is completely different than these other kids who are quite suddenly trans, likely after... I doubt they watched her show because she doesn't make it look fun. I, they probably looked at her Instagram where it's all like happiness, right? And said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this and I'm going to get the party and I'm going um, to be special or I'm going to alleviate my suffering, whatever the motivations are. And I do think, yes, the medical associations have done the same thing. Yes, the mental health field has done it. But I do think that if legacy media or mainstream media had simply reported the story just, just to say what happened, we would not be in this position. All we needed to do was talk about what happened to all of your families. And I'm very personally sensitive to the impact on families because of the family I come from and because of the family I have now. And I consider this story to be in part about a real abuse of state power. When CPS is called on you because you haven't used your child's pronouns, I cannot think of a worse abuse of state power. Oh, no, I'm sure I can, but... but <laughs> It's an abuse of state power. And I was at, a, at an event at Columbia Journalism School recently, and I went up to Jelani Cobb, the New Yorker writer, now I'm gonna name names, and, um, and head of the, of the Columbia Journalism School, and I told him about the book I'm working on, and I told him that some families have been destroyed by this. And he looked at me with like just complete skepticism. What are you talking about, right? The burden of proof is on me. And I explained about the CPS being called on parents and they just didn't, he did not believe me. And I've had meetings at the New York Times, at CNN, at the Washington Post, I've had meetings and I've explained it to people and they don't believe me. But the reason I'm telling you this, not just to exonerate myself because of my guilt, um, <laughs> is that they know, they've been told, they know. So I don't know how we hold the mainstream media to account. You notice I'm just like going back and forth between left, liberal, mainstream, legacy media, because I don't know what anything is anymore, but, but we should. And you can see in the comments of stories on the Times, and a lot of you people in here are the ones commenting, that there's, <laughs> so much dissonance between the way they're reporting and, and what the actual readers are experiencing. The same way that, that Lior brought up, like, or somebody yeah. brought up, you know, most Democrats are against. We, so we, we need to. Okay, bye. Thank you. <laughs> Pressure the media okay. to yeah. do better. Thank you very much.